Hi folks, Jim Woodford here. As I was telling you earlier, I was just absolutely engaged and thrilled with the beauty of heaven, the flowers, the, 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 the uh, hospitality of the angels, the incredible things that I was shown and what was explained to me. And as we walked along this beautiful path, no wider than maybe 10 feet wide, with an angel on either side of me and the tall angel behind, <clears throat> they graciously answered every question that I had and yet downloaded me with even more knowledge of the beauty and the mysteries of God's home. I spoke also earlier of how God in his infinite mercy and compassion, when you make the departure from this world and enter his kingdom, he understands perfectly as only a father can. What a huge transition it is for you. And so for me, it was being able to smell tapioca <laughs> that my grandmother would make for me. But then as we walked along this path, I was absolutely stunned to see what God had in store for me next. We came up to this beautiful split rail fence and the angel to my right makes a motion with his hand and I hear his voice and he said, James, look. I look across this pasture and there are three of the most magnificent horses you could ever imagine. Horses in heaven. Of course, I had never studied the Bible or scripture. I didn't know that it says that when Jesus comes back, he'll be riding a white horse. But suddenly I had this feeling I was even more at home. There was another reason to be here, not just the tapioca. There were horses in heaven. And as I stunned, as I stared at these in stunned amazement, the angel raised his hand the horses looked up at him, he made a motion, and instantly they started to come across. And as they trotted across the beautiful green grass of heaven, with every step they took, as with every step I took, light sparkled out from their hooves as they came toward me. Oh, stunningly beautiful. And they came right up to the gate, and I'm just in awe. There was a beautiful white horse those of you that are of my vintage will remember the Lone Ranger's horse, Silver. It looked like silver. And then there was a, a beautiful bay, not unlike um, uh, 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 horses we've had in the past, and a beautiful palomino. And my wife has a palomino at home. Her name is Honey. And so I'm absolutely, uh, as I say, uh, out of my mind with happiness because this is something I can relate to. I can really understand. And the tall one came up and stared over the fence at me. And as I gazed into its shining eyes, it, I felt as though it was trying to communicate with me. It was trying to thank me for all the kindness that I had shown his kind on earth. And I couldn't resist. Once again, I put my hand forward through the rails and went to stroke the beautiful neck of this silver horse. And when I did, when my, my hand went right into the silken light of its body. And again, when I pulled my hand back, that light tried to cling to my hand just as it had with the angel until I withdrew my hand through the fence and then the light went, let go and went back into the body of the horse. Once again, a shining, wonderful example of the sticky love of God. I'm just amazed and so grateful. I'm looking at horses in heaven and I'm looking around at the brilliant sky with no sun, the amazing flowers, the, the sense of peace, the sense of, of being at home. And as I'm looking around, I look to my right up in the sky and I saw something that I had never noticed before. You all know what contrails are. You see a jet go overhead on a sunny day, it's high in the atmosphere, and you can see the contrails. And I look, and these look like contrails going up through the skies of heaven. But unlike here, where we have the circumference of the earth, the contrails are always dipping to match the circumference. But these were going straight up, bright white arcs of light going straight up. And I'm mystified. I knew, or I didn't think, there were aircraft in heaven. 
but I'm looking at them. And remember, the angels could hear everything I thought. And I turned to the, to the uh, angel to my right and I said, what are those? And there were six of them. What are those? And what he said brought me to tears. And it does to this day. Because remember, I said to you, I believe there are six words, God forgive me, God help me, and the prayers of my family that are responsible for me being sent back along with the will of Jesus. And as I looked at those streaks of beautiful streaks flashing up in the skies of heaven, the angel turned to me with a look of love in those violet eyes. And he said, those James are the prayers of your family for your soul. The prayers of my family for my soul. And I began to weep. And I found out later after I had come back and Lorraine and I tried to put the timeline together of what had happened, that in fact, when the, she had been told by the police that I had been found because I had <clears throat> died in my truck, but that it didn't look good and that my body was being taken to the hospital to be triaged, that she and her sister Shelley, her husband Dave, and they are amazing prayer warriors. And I always thought, how can these nice people be so brainwashed to believe there's a heaven? But no matter what happened in their life, they always relied on the goodness of God or the belief that God would get them through. So there was Lorraine, her sister Shelley, her husband David, her other sister Karen, her other sister Jeannie, and Jeannie's son Matthew, who is a captain with an airline here in the United States. They formed a prayer circle in our kitchen. And David led the prayer that if it be the will of Jesus, to send Jim back, that they didn't want to face life without me in their lives. And I was overwhelmed by their love. And now I'm seeing their prayers go up to heaven. It, it's their prayers for my soul. And the angel went on to tell me that prayer matters, but we have become a culture of instantaneous gratification. We go to church on Sunday. We pray to God for something. Doesn't happen by Tuesday. God didn't hear it. God doesn't care. We tell you this. Every prayer that you have ever uttered, every wish that you have prayed to God for is recorded and noted in heaven. And it is recorded and held in the halls of knowledge. Every prayer, along with every transgression, along with every act of kindness that you've done, they monitor our lives, not to put us in a we got you moment, but they want to have everything in your life so that if you do have the possibility of getting to heaven, they do a life review with you. And they have everything that you've done, wished you had done, wished you had not done, recorded. So prayer matters. Prayer matters. It matters always, but sadly the angel said, mankind is losing the will and the ability to pray. When our grandparents and our ancestors, after a long hard day of labor, what did they do? After the family was fed, they had eventide, where they sat around and they prayed together or they read the Bible. Now in our busy life, what do we do? We get a few spare minutes, we text, or we call someone, or we watch TV. You must remember that those periods of calm and quiet that come into an increasingly busy life is God saying to you, my child, I give you these quiet moments to sit and speak with me. Tell me of your worries and I will give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. Look, I have nothing against texting or calling. I do it myself. I will tell you this. God does love a knee mail. So send God all the knee mails you can. So I'm standing there so overwhelmed 
by the fact that my family loved me that much, they were praying for my return. And as I'm staring in disbelief at their prayers, I realized that I, uh, I felt a tug on my sleeve and I turned and it was the 13 foot tall angel. Now up to this point, he or she had not said much. And I say he or she because it was as though they were the best of both their genders. Um, they had this gentleness of a, of, of, a, of a female, but the strength of a male. And it was a most unique feeling. But it doesn't really matter. They're creatures of God. But he said to me, James, look. And he offered his hand to me. And I took his hand. And as I did, he brought his other arm back. And this gigantic opening appeared. And suddenly, we're above this opening looking down. And I realize, I realize that I am being given a glimpse of the holy city, the kingdom of heaven, the home of God and Jesus. And with the enhanced vision I told you about earlier, where I had peripheral vision and binocular and telephotic, telephotic vision, I was able to look and look down at buildings and look around buildings and look between buildings. People say to me, did you see your family? And no, I did not. But you see, I didn't know at that time that, that I wasn't staying. I had no idea. But it was explained to me that you pass through two veils. I had passed through the veil of death, but there's another veil before the gates of heaven. And you must go through that before you meet your family. I had not penetrated that veil. They knew I wasn't staying. I didn't know. But I'm, I'm just stunned because I'm looking down. Now, how do I begin to ask you to suspend the laws of physics that you have grown up with, experienced, and studied. You must stop, take off your earth hat, and put on your heaven hat, and suspend the laws of physics. Imagine a land where past, present, and future is all collapsed into one, where spatial references do not exist as they do on earth, where infinity is forever where you look off in the distance and there's no end to the distance. The spatial references are completely different. Incredible beauty everywhere. I'm looking down and the mo one of the most <coughs> often asked questions I get is, are the streets golden? And yes, they are. The streets of heaven are golden. Golden but not the brassy gold that you would expect that we've, I think, traditionally associate with the look of gold, not the Fort Knox gold. It was as though all the impurities had been removed from the gold and the streets were paved with this. And so it gave a translucence to this gold that appeared to be three dimensional. And yet people walked on it and or glided above it. And, and I noticed that as it moved toward that beautiful light on the horizon, the closer it got, the more transparent that gold became. It became as glass. And, and I'm just uh, stunned because I'm looking down on the immensity of heaven. It is huge by human standards. Imagine where distance and time doesn't matter. But this amazing world that exists and, and beautiful circular golden boulevards uh, interspersed with broad greenways of, of beautiful flowers in, in a scope and a size beyond imagination. I mean, this went off to the horizon and interspersed in that beautiful buildings all around and in the greenways and meandering through all of heaven, these beautiful streams that all made their way to the river of life. And the water, this cascading fountains, and the water and the translucency of the water, of the crystal water as it moved along, was, was, was in, not just intriguing because it behaved differently than water on earth, but it looked like liquid crystal had found a way to flow. And 
but I'm looking down at hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And with my ability to focus, I could see their faces and, and, and of all tribes, all nations, but they're beings of light, beings of light, but they have a countenance. And as I look down on these, on, on the citizens of heaven, there was something I was seeing, but not understanding. And I really struggled. What, what is it I'm seeing, but not understanding? And finally, I turned to the tall angel and I said, am I seeing this correctly? Because it seems to me, with a few exceptions, everyone that I'm looking at appears to be in their early 30s. Am I seeing this correctly? And the tall angel smiled at me very benevolently. And he said in that beautiful, deep voice, yes, James, you are correct. And he went on to say that no one in heaven is any older than Jesus was when he died at the crucifixion. So I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to being 33 again or approximately that age. God so appreciated and loved the sacrifice of Jesus for us that he decreed that no one in heaven would be any older than Jesus was when he died. Which begs an, uh, an honest question. If that's the case and we get there and you get through the second veil, how will you know your family? How will you know your great grandmother? Very few of us have pictures of our great, great, great grandparents. How will you know your family? Yes, you have the countenance you had on earth, but you're 33 and you're glowing with this light. But see, God's got it all worked out. Just as we have a human DNA family on, whole, at, at, on earth, you have a soul family <laughs> in heaven, an ancestral soul family. And they greet you and they will know your soul and you will know their soul before you recognize their features. And once your soul connects with them, you know, yes, that looks like my mom looked like her mother. That must be my grandmother. It's beautiful the way God has organized it for us. It answers so many questions for people. So I, ca I can't wait to, to get back and see my family, to see my father who died when I was two, to see my grandparents who had such an important part of, of raising me, good, loving people. And as I looked down, they began to describe to me these magnificent buildings that I'm looking at. And there's the halls of learning, the halls of knowledge, the halls of healing the halls of music, and everyone was engaged. Uh, no one seemed to have a sense of trudging off to work. You'd see, you'd see these beings of light walking arm in arm, just as you would take them to Charlotte, downtown Charlotte, and show them the sights. And you could tell who was the newcomer and who was, had been to heaven before, because they were pointing out the various features of the holy city. And people seemed to be just so full of love. And yet some people were walking with musical instruments under their arm with a sense of purpose. Others had books under their arm. And I really believe if you think you're going to be bored in heaven, think again. Think again. Everything that, is, that you've ever wanted to do within the law of God is possible. But let me talk for a second about the halls of knowledge. This is the repository of all the books of our life and all the knowledge of God and Jesus that is we are permitted to know. And the halls of learning are where you go to study those, the mysteries of God. And I said to the angel, I said, why would you require a hall of healing? Because there, there's no pain, there's no death, there's no disease, there's no glasses, there's no wheelchairs, there's no walkers, there's no canes. Why do you recall why, why do you require a hall of healing? And his answer, I think, speaks once again to the compassion of the almighty creator for us. And he described to me this scenario. He said, many people who in their last nanoseconds of life, just as you, James, 
accepted Jesus and God accepted you and forgave you. Those people, many of them have led a life of great trauma on earth. They were either drug addicts or alcoholics, or they've been terribly mistreated in relationships and their souls are hurt. Their souls are damaged. And so when they get to heaven, if they accept Jesus, they go into the halls of healing and there, there the angels explain to them what went wrong in their life, what, what happened to them, but that the love of God is above anything that could happen to you on earth. And, and there they're made to understand the fullness of God's love for them. And they're shown all the many times that despite the life of trauma they lived, that God stepped in to protect them for the moment when they would join him in heaven. The halls of healing. But there was one building that really fascinated me. These buildings, folks, they, they weren't, they, they were built in the style of the Parthenon and, and great, uh, I suppose, like the temple in Jerusalem, massive buildings, but they had a softness about them. And the softness was because they weren't created from cold stone or marble. They were created as though they were melted from or melted from blocks of, of light. And there was a warmth that came from these buildings that you could sense. And, and it was the warmth of heaven, the warmth of God's holy city. And I, I'm just stunned by the beauty of it. And, but there was one building to the left as we're looking down that absolutely floored me in its beauty. Absolutely floored me in its beauty. It was a building that had a softness that was different. And there was this huge expanse of Greenland in, in front of it. And playing on that were thousands of children, kids in heaven, children playing with dogs and cats and birds and other animals. And I'm absolutely dumbfounded because I'm looking down as though you were looking at any huge playground in the United States or Canada. And the children were enjoying themselves. They were playing. And I said, what is this building? And the angel looked at me with a twinkle in those violet eyes. And he said, that James is the nursery. I said, nursery in heaven? He said, yes, James. This is where the souls of aborted children come back to when they are refused life on earth. Remember I talked about the spirit or the light that's in each one of you? When a, when, a, a, when a baby is refused life, God takes that precious spirit, his own life, and brings it back to the, to the nursery. And there, that little spirit is raised until it's in the fullness of God and explained why it had to come back. And I was just overwhelmed. Look, never in my life had I ever thought seriously about abortion. It wasn't my problem. But now I understand that the compassion of God for every one of us, for the light and the spirit in us is so complete that he protects that life and brings it back to his kingdom. And so I said to the angel, well, are they like children on earth? And he chuckled and he said, oh yeah, very much so. And, and he, he went on to tell me, and I said, well, are they, do they behave like children? He said, just like on earth. But he said they grow differently because they're not growing a physical body. They're growing a spiritual body. They mature three times as fast as a child on earth. So a child of two on earth is six in heaven. When they're three on earth, they're nine in heaven. When they're four on earth, they're 12 in heaven. It's a factor of three. And once they reach 11, they're the age of 33 the age that Jesus was when he died. And I was overwhelmed by the kindness and the love of God for everything. For everything. And I have to tell you this quickly. When I look down at an audience and I see a couple weeping because they lost a child, 
not just through abortion, but through a miscarriage or through an accident or a disease. That child is also brought back to the nursery in heaven where they're cared for until the fullness of their innocence is prepared. Again, a shining example of the compassion and the mercy and the love of God for each one of you. And that is my central mission, is to make you understand the completeness, the wonder of God's love for your spirit, because your spirit is his spirit and he honors it, but he gives you free will to decide what you do with it. That although they record the transgressions of our life, once you accept Jesus, then the blood of Jesus covers all those sins and they are completely washed away. There is no record anymore. How wonderful, how truly forgiving. And so to be given this glimpse of heaven, it's important you understand that I never did set foot in the holy city. You have to go through the second veil, but I was given this incredible virtual tour of heaven. And there's so much in our book that I think will be a blessing to you to help you understand what awaits you in the heavenly city. It is truly a wonderful, incredible, infinite place to spend eternity. I, I pray with all my heart that this description of heaven is a blessing to you. Because you see, Jesus always promised us that one day we would be with him in paradise. And it is possible. But the first step on that journey is your accepting Jesus into your heart, into your, into your spirit, into your very being, in the privacy of your own home, in the privacy of your car, in the darkness of the night. Open your heart. Open your heart to God. Open your heart to his son, Jesus. You will forever, ever be gifted with the most incredible place to spend eternity, the place that, that goes beyond description. But I want you to remember when you get there that I told you about it first. God bless you. Have you ever wondered what heaven is truly like? Do you know someone who questions life after death? Now you can know the testimonies of people who experienced life after death. You will receive James D. Woodford's brand new powerful book, Heaven, An Unexpected Journey. Through this book, you will read about his firsthand experience with heaven, angels, and the afterlife. Encounter the glories of heaven and the stunning reality of the unseen world. Understand what it's like to hug an angel. Encounter the chilling realities of hell and the the sights, sounds, and sensations of heaven. Read and hear first-hand accounts about the awesome beauty of Jesus, full of overpowering love and compassion. Gain faith to believe God for your own healing as you understand that God has a body parts room in heaven where miracles are waiting to be accessed. Take a tour of God's heavenly library with volumes of books that contain the accounts of each person's life. Learn how your prayers are converted into visible fire and rivers that ascend to heaven. You can get a digital copy of James Woodford's book, Heaven, An Unexpected Journey, by clicking the link below or by going to sidroth.org heaven.